sometimes when we're looking at trying to optimize a situation, there are some additional constraints that come into play. In other words, it's not just that we're optimizing a function, but we're optimizing a function with some constraints. Well, how does that change our approach? And uh, can we still do it? And the answer is, there is a way to deal with optimization with constraints that we can use our techniques on. Let's take a look. So again, we're going to focus on, in particular, optimizing a function f of xy, given that g of xy is equal to a constant. So I'm thinking of that as my constraint. I'm going to say, look, I'm at the point where g of xy is a fixed value. Well, how do we know how to find these problems? They're really easy. You look for phrases like given that, such that, satisfying. In other words, we're saying, hey, you're looking at this function, you're trying to find a max or a min, but there's some other things you have to take into consideration. Whenever you see that, oh, there's other things, like, okay, well, how do we do that? Now, there's a nice underlying philosophy about maximums and minimums. And when you say it out loud, you're like, well, it's so clear, can it be useful? And it's the following. It says, when you're at an optimum, doesn't matter, max or min, you shouldn't move. And in other words, look, if you're, an, uh, if you're at a maximum, there's no way for you to move and get even bigger because that sort of defeats the idea of saying that you're at a maximum. So one of the things we can do is say, all right, maybe we should identify the places where we have no incentive to move because those are places where our optimum could occur. All right, so here's sort of our intuition. I'm going to think of the constraint as being a curve. So it might be a curve. It could be any kind of curve, really. But g of x, y equal to some constant c. And I'm going to zoom in on a little piece. And now I might ask the question, OK, am I at an optimum at that point? Is this point an optimum value? Now, notice because we're on the curve and we have to stay on the curve, I can't move freely. So I'm not claiming that the function itself is at an optimum. I have to ask, is the function at an optimum with regard to the curve? So when we think about the curve, we say, well, look, we really can move in two directions. We can move along that curve, along essentially the tangent line. And what we want to know is, what would happen if we did move just a little bit? Oftentimes, calculus boils down to, can we understand and what's happening in the nearby? Well, what can we do? Now, let's suppose we look at the gradient. Because why would we do that? Well, I want to look at the gradient because I really want to understand what's happening if I move in those directions. And by what's happening, What's happening to our function? Is it going up or down? That's a question about derivatives. And since we're asking about directions, we should do directional derivatives, which means gradients. So let's for a second suppose that my gradient did that. So this was the gradient of f. And at this point, it pointed off in that direction. And in particular, what would we have? Well, we'd have our angles we have two of them, right? Depend upon which way we go. Now, one angle in here, this would be an acute angle, which means it's a very small angle, below 90 degrees. And over here, this would be an obtuse angle, above 90 degrees. If that's the case, what's true? Well, if we now move in the direction along our curve, just just a little bit. So because we're moving nearby, we can assume we move like in a straight line. What happens is we can say the directional derivative is positive. Because when you look at directional derivative, it's determined by looking at your gradient dot your direction. Well, if our angle is below 90, that dot product will become positive. So directional derivative is positive, which means we can get larger by moving up. On the other hand, if we move in this direction, 
towards the obtuse angle, our directional derivative will be negative. Again, you look at the formula for a dot product. When your angle is obtuse, you get a negative dot product. Well, that says our directional derivative is down. And so by moving a little bit, just a little bit, we can decrease. And we say, OK, well, that says, look, if my gradient of my vector f is coming off of here, and I look at the angle, if it if it's, forms an angle that's acute to one side or the other, then I can't be at a maximum point. So what does that tell us about our gradient? Well, the intuition says, if I'm at a maximum, the gradient to f has to be doing something where it's perpendicular. That's the key idea. So given that we have our constraint, we say, all right, we need to have it be the case that the gradient is perpendicular to the curve. So there we go. That's what we got to this point right here. Our gradient is perpendicular. Now we say, well, what else is perpendicular? Well, what is g of x, y? It really, it's like a level curve. The level curve to the surface, z equals g of x, y. And we know that gradients are perpendicular to level curves. And so now we have this beautiful idea. So we know that the gradient of f is perpendicular to our level curve. The gradient of g is perpendicular to our level curve. So they're both perpendicular. How is that possible? It's possible if they're both parallel to each other. So we say, aha, it must be the case that if we are at an optimum, that our gradient to the function we're trying to optimize is some multiple of the gradient of that curve. That some multiple is really just rephrasing it as it's parallel to. So that's capturing a parallelness. Now, that's one relationship that has to be satisfied. Another relationship is, look, this constraint has to be satisfied. So we have to satisfy that the gradients are perpendicular and that the constraint is satisfied. And now we have a system of equations. So what's our process? Well, our process now proceeds essentially what's given here. Set up our system of equations. Gradient of f equals lambda gradient of g, and g equals c. Now notice, when we look at this system, we've introduced something new, and it's called lambda, so this multiplier. In essence, we really don't care about lambda. Lambda is the least important thing. On a side note, it's called Lagrange multiplier. We'll talk about Lagrange in a second here. And uh, so what do we end up having to do? Well, what we have, is a system of just the right number of equations and unknowns. But this can be fun because these are not going to be linear equations and linear unknowns. It can be kind of dicey to solve for. So you have to find all the solutions. Now, here's some advice. And it's very simple. If you're stuck, just remember, when in doubt, solve for lambda. Because in some sense, lambda is the least important thing. We don't really care about. What we care about are the points, the coordinates that come out. And so you can say, look, I can solve for lambda. Now you might say, what do you mean by solve for lambda? I can't take a, a vector divided by a vector. But what you can do is you can say, look, this leads to a system. This is really fx equals lambda gx, fy equals lambda gy. And then you can say lambda which becomes fx over gx and fy over gy. Just, of course, take it with a small, little tiny bit of grain of salt. That interesting things can happen. But really, what it boils down to in the end is it says, oh, okay, fx times gy has to equal fy times gx. And now this gives us essentially an additional formula along with our constraint. So now we have two equations. See, we were able to use lambda to knock it down. That's what we mean by when in doubt, solve for lambda.
Now, after you've solved for lambda, you take those points, you plug it into the function, and you interpret the results. A couple of notes here. This has been talked about for functions of two variables. For functions of more than two variables, same process. So in other words, again, gradient of f equals lambda gradient of g, g equals c. Set up your system of equations. It's just here, instead of two equations, you're really going to have three equations because you have three entries. So any number of variables works. That's point number one. Point number two. When we say interpret the results, we really mean uh, be careful. It's very easy to misinterpret what's going on. And indeed, there are examples in the past when there have been calculus exams where we, we put a problem on it, and we say find the max, and people find an answer, and they say, oh, there's two numbers, I'll take the larger one. Well, it turns out the larger one is actually a min. Aha, uh -huh. what, huh, how? Well, we'll tell that story when we do the practice. When we're doing this, essentially what's happening is we're finding where the optimums should be, and that's what you need to keep in mind. We found where the optimum should be. We haven't identified what kind of optimum we have. And so if you're really interested to say, I want to be sure, I want to be absolutely positive that I found the largest or the smallest, depending upon the problem, what can you do? Well, the answer is, go back to the philosophy we talked about. If we're at the largest or the smallest, we should have no incentive to move. So think about what happens if you perturb. Move a little bit along your constraint and compare on either side. And that will tell you whether or not you found your max, your min, or something else interesting is going on. All right, good. Well, that's the idea. Now, before you leave, you might be wondering a little bit about Lagrange. He is a, a French mathematician. But not only that, in fact, I looked it up, and uh, I want to show you a little bit here. It turns out that Lagrange multipliers is named after Joseph Lagrange. Now, he had a student who studied under him. His name was Simeon Poisson. And Simeon had a student, Michel Chalet, who had a student, Hubert Newton, who had a student, E.H. Moore, who also had a student, George Burkhoff, who also had a student, Hassler Whitney, who also had a student, Herbert Robbins, who also had a student, Herbert Wilf, who also had a student, Fan Chung, who also had me. That's me. And so, if you think about, you know, in, in academics, we talk about an academic parent. Who did you study under? So, for example, Fan Chung, she is my academic parent. And, uh, they're oftentimes a very close relationship. Fan Chung, she's like my Chinese mother and a wonderful person. And so, what can I say? Well, Joseph Lagrange is my great, 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 great academic grandparent. And so, channeling the spirit of Lagrange, just remember, when in doubt, solve for lambda, and you'll be in good shape. All right, well, time to go and do some practice. See you soon.